people say you brought to this election? What, what is that thing like for, for people to think about you? Yeah. I would hope, number one, to say people brought a bit of relief uh, from the craziness. Uh, that's, that's what I always feel comedy is. It's an outlet. It's a place where we can, we can uh, vent our frustrations, but in a healthy atmosphere. So after that, I would hope people would go, okay, this, this is, um, we had the right information. We laughed about the right things. We had an honest perspective on it. And uh, now we don't have to think about it for a while. That's what I hope people would say. Well, not their decision, their decision they should think about for a while. Right, you think about it. So here you are, in, in, I'm your campaign around the world. You come from South Africa to the United States. Yes. How how long did it take you to like figure out the gig here? You apparently you've done it brilliantly. You've adapted to American politics and you know, in American culture. How did, how did that come about? Was it instantaneous, or did you study it, or did you talk to people? Tell us a little bit about that process. I find um, when I first came to America, the hardest thing I had to learn was uh, the fact that as strange as it was conversation wasn't as frank as it was in South Africa. You know, so I came from a world where democracy was fresh, the conversation and discourse around what was happening was fresh, and so niceties were put to the side uh, in exchange for honesty. You know, so people worried less about how others would feel about what they're saying and rather worry about communicating effectively what they felt. Uh, so that was the one thing I had to learn was there was a certain level of tiptoeing that had to be performed uh, you know, when, when doing stand-up in America. But for the most part, I've, I've found this is one of the most comfortable places to exist in because our histories are so similar. You know, we, we, we both have South Africa and America with histories of, of oppression, histories of, of people fighting for their rights, histories of, of a change of impossible terms. You know, people seeing things that they thought they'd never to see. First black president was just as crazy in South Africa as I feel as it was here, you know? So, so all of those evolutions, I understand in a slightly, from a slightly different prison. You know, I go, this, this, this makes sense to me. The only difference is uh, the power shift in South Africa, obviously, uh, is the majority of people are black there, so, so the power shift was, was a bigger one than it was in America. But instead, in terms of understanding the dynamics, I find a lot of it's the same. Just an honest discussion, so you go back to South Africa, let's say you're the pub. And you talk. At the pub? Or, or wherever. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> So if, let's say if you, if you talk about something like a, a debate, a Republican debate, it was crazy to see how little of that world we see in South Africa versus what you get here. Here there is a mass consumption and uh, often artificial creation of hype around a, a, an election. You know, mm -hmm. like I like I'm, I don't understand the polls, for instance. I genuinely do not understand them. The logic of it doesn't like there's there's no logic to it sometimes. So people go. He's number one in the polls. And I say, so he's gonna win. They go, oh no, the polls don't mean anything. <laughs> I say, well, well then why do you have the polls? Oh, because we need them to tell us what's gonna happen. I say, well, that's not logical. And people go, yeah, that works. <laughs> what would we do without the polls? You would, uh, what would happen? I just, I don't understand. At some point, this, 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 this blows my mind. So every single, every single election cycle, you're going to have a bunch of crazy people leading in the polls, a bunch of people stirring people. This, this, is, what, this is what frightens me with the polls. Okay. If you have a, a radical the that says, uh, yeah, 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 you do. <laughs> so let's say you, you have radicals. Okay. So let's say you have radicals that are saying crazy things in public forums. Often those people are regarded as radicals and people who are not, uh, you know, the most sane individuals. But then when a poll comes out that verifies that this person is in the front, and you know, they go, there's a front runner, this is somebody that could become the president, I sometimes go, you are almost, in a strange way, uh, you're adding credence to what they're doing. You know, sometimes I go, well, now that person goes, you see, I said the thing, 
and the votes are in my favor, so I'm saying the right thing. And it's like, no, no, you, you're not. It's just the sum of people are crazy, but they don't know that. <laughs> and then some of the crazy people out there, or some of the people who don't have the right views, or maybe have fringe views, go, oh, this is the right thing to go for because it is number one. And I, I think that's it's a slippery slope sometimes trying to understand what the poll is supposed it, to be. It is, but if you, you think about it for a second, the Republican Party is 40% of the country. And 30% of that 40 can create a lot of havoc in the way that our democracy works. And yes. I think that's what we see in that. So when you look at, you know, you look at the Republican side, and you see Trump, or you, you know, you did a piece on, and I'm gonna get, you did a piece on Ben Carson that I thought was, was utterly brilliant about him. I think he would have done it if he was in there. But, uh, Trump is talking about the, the largest mass deportation in human history. Yes. Does that, does that like, what, what do you think of that? How, how do you, how do you, guy, you're a young guy, you're, you're multicultural, multi-everything, and you, you see somebody talking about, we get a forum today and says, we got to understand people are not getting a raise in their paycheck. So I, my boss said, you get a raise, it's good, let's deport 12 million people. <laughs> What do you, what do you, how, do you, how do you process that? I identify with it, strangely enough. South Africa, over the years, has been, uh, in many ways, strangely enough, referred to as the America of Africa. They, go, you, they say South Africa is the United States of, you know, America of Africa. Like, we, we are considered to be uh, ahead, we are considered to be extremely um, industrialized compared to many other places in the continent. We have a great economy. And we are considered as being the most ignorant on the continent. Um, <laughs> this, this is honestly true. And, 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 so, <laughs> and, and if you look at what's happening in South Africa, we have a lot of people who uh, unfortunately have, have swayed towards a xenophobic sentiment because the leaders haven't given them the true answers about why things are going wrong. So when I see Donald Trump doing what he does or saying what he says, I go, I've seen that saying this back home. It's the honest truth. Someone goes up and they go, this is the opportunity. When people are starving, you can, you can sell them any story. You know, Hitler did it in, in, in Germany. He said, he said, you know why you're hungry? It's because of these people. And that's the best time to mobilize anyone when they're hungry and when they're scared. You can give them any story because people want change. And so you can give them that change. And the worst time you, you, you find as a human being is when you're hungry, when you're afraid, you will make decisions that you would not normally make. And so, when I see Donald Trump say these things, I go, I know, I know what this is. I've seen this before. I come from a place where, at times, xenophobia has risen to a point where there's violence in the streets against people from other countries. And so, um, you you have to, you just have to be careful with how much, uh, I guess, credence you give it. So that's the scary thing for me. Okay. So, could it? You know, we sit here and we say, Nah, this is America. Could it happen here? Could we have like violence? Could we have like people attacking a, a, a group of people because they were different than them? Do, do you think that that, that could happen? You can always. I mean, attack it. I mean, violently attack it. I'm not talking about yeah, it. Yeah, but it can always happen. We are all we are all people on the same. It's just the spectrum of how hungry or scared we are. It can always always happen. It's just about who you are made to believe the enemy is, and that is often what happens. Is that those in power, uh, you know, on, on various sides, those in power are very smart at making it seem like the problem doesn't come from their side, but from another source. And then the people on the ground go, well, that's an easier thing to comprehend. It's hard for me to understand that my problems come from the back of the fact that there is no bipartisanship in Congress, and I don't understand how the, the House actually works. But if you tell me that the reason I don't have a job is because of that brown fella that skipped over the border, that's something I can understand, and that's something I can do something about. And I think if you let it get far enough, you can never say it will never happen. So let's skip a little bit to the Democratic side, because you know about I'm for a certain candidate, I'll make it a few advice. But you had a very harsh criticism about her on, I think it was the Rita Dunham show or something like that. Well, it wasn't harsh. Well, but, but tell us what you had. I think the criticism was an observation. An observation. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Often the criticism is, is, uh, is people assume an observation is criticism. You made an observation. Yes. 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 So let's just play this thought again and tell you so funny. If you were sitting in the green room with Hillary Clinton and she said, give me a quick piece of advice about my campaign just between you and I, what would you tell me? <laughs> One piece of advice? <laughs> Go ahead. You're, I mean, you're the man. You, you know what the hell? You got your back there, and you're just you and her. Or 
I would say, but this is this is tough because I because I don't know her for certain. I can only know what I know from the media. I can only know what I know from the reports and the things I read. But strangely, I would say to her, stop trying to be and just be. I know some people. So, I'm talking a little bit about South Africa. I think we were talking about it. I've never been to South Africa before. I always wanted to go. When I go and I take my family, what is it that you want me to see about your country? What would you say? In, in, you know, I know it's actually great and everything else, but what is it you want me to experience to see about your country? I would love for you to experience the freshness of it all. You know, uh, one thing that I've never taken for granted is, is freedom. You know, I, I, I've traveled to many places in the world and I've seen how people take freedom for granted. And one thing we have in South Africa is, is a, it's a freshness, it is a fresh democracy. It is not a, it's not a honeymoon by any means, it's very difficult. And one thing I think we've learned in South Africa is that freedom is extremely hard work, you know, which a lot of people never consider. But it's often easier to live in a place of oppression because you don't have to work hard to better the world that you're in because you can always focus on the fact that you're limited. But once you get that freedom, you start to realize what, what hard work it actually is. But the, I enjoy the rawness of South Africa. It's a beautiful thing. I mean, I think you would appreciate it. Seeing a fledgling democracy, seeing a world of people, and also seeing, um, I think, an honest representation of it. Like, I always say to people, when you go, you now have equal rights. Let's say the law changes. You know, Hillary actually said this, which I agree with. She said, uh, you don't, you don't uh, change hearts, you change laws. And in South Africa, that's very prevalent. You will see things have changed. You know, you know the law has changed, but the hearts and the minds of many have not changed. They are changing over time, but it's so interesting to be there at the very beginning, where you where you see that starting to take shape, and you see people evolving. And some kind of stand, some people go, I, I don't want to be here anymore. I'm going to leave, and those who have means leave. But it's it's beautiful to see it in its in its purest form. It is it is uncut, brand new democracy. That's what I love for you to see. Now, now conversely, you know, people that you grew up with, you know, we've been to the United States, and call and said, Trevor, I'm coming to the United States. What would you like for your friends in South Africa to come here? What would you like them to see and know about the United States? One thing I would love for them to see is what would happen to us if we stopped having honest discussion that's one thing I would love for them to see. I would say America for me is, is almost like a vision of the future. It's like I've gotten to time travel and see what democracy might become, where I'm from. And I would, I would say to them, see what happens when you no longer engage from an honest place, but engage from a space that you feel is defined by who you are or what you think you represent. Because that's one thing that throws me off when, I, when I'm here, is that uh, the reaction to a lot of things that let's say anyone says in the political sphere is often driven first and foremost by the position that the the recipient is in. So let me use Ben Carson as an example. Okay, Ben Carson had the comments about the already shooting. He says, uh, this is what I would have done. Uh, people should have rushed the government and so on and, and so forth. And everyone rushes to you crazy, you you crazy man, you crazy. The first thing I say is, is he, uh, is he crazy? Mm -hmm. You rushed the government? Like, Go on, he's right. He's actually right. Yeah, if people rush the government, there is a chance, there is a chance that the person will be able to kill the best people. But he is callous, and he is not considering the fact that you're talking about humans and not soldiers. You know what I mean? So so the first thing I asked is funny, I asked one of the security men at, at the Daily Show, I said, what, are you, what is your training in this regard? What do you do as a professional, as an ex-marine, as someone that's trained in, in in uh, defense, what do you do? And he said, well, there's so many factors you have to consider. Are you close to the government? Then you should rush in. If you're far from the government, then you should get to cover. Are you uh, are you protecting somebody? Are you trying to protect yourself? Who should go? Who should? They even have to go for training every year. People 
people in, in, the, in the, 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 the defense field have to go for training. They have to, they have to learn how to get shot. So that when they're getting shot, it doesn't throw off their mind, it doesn't throw off their senses. So for somebody like Ben Carson to say that, I go, it's callous and it's, it's, it's not calculated to say people should do this. Most people cannot do it. But I do not come from the place of he's wrong because I stand on the opposite side of him. Because where I come from, there is no opposite side per se. We don't have liberal or democrat where I'm from. We have political parties. Uh, and they, within those parties, you have people that agree or disagree. Some people swing more to the left, some more to the right. But the party has to try and aim its vision in the right direction and go, what are we trying to do as opposed to what should we do according to who we claim to be? And that's the one thing I would want South Africans to know when they come here. Don't stop thinking for yourselves. But don't stop thinking about the honest response and the honest reaction based on what people have told you your role should be. You know what I mean? You can be a liberal person who is slightly conservative. You can be a conservative who is slightly more liberal. That shouldn't be, it shouldn't just be this, this divide in the middle. It's not black and white. Nuance is most of what's happening in and around us. And that's what I want South Africans to know when they come here. In, in, in Contradictory thought. You can think. Yeah, you can yeah. think two things that, that, that you know. That you can you can think two contradictory thoughts at the same time. In fact, yeah. two contradictory opinions can be correct. Yeah. You, you can say you know it's really hard going out and being a young black male, and it's also hard being a police officer. Definitely, okay, it's okay to think both of those thoughts which, simultaneously. But which it is, and that's what people should be thinking is. It is hard on both ends. And you know, it's funny because um, it was uh, Barack Obama who said this at Nelson Mandela's memorial in South Africa. I'll never forget, he said, Nelson Mandela was my hero. I may be paraphrasing, but the, the line that stuck out to me was he said, because he showed not only could you free the prisoner, but he also showed that you need to free the guard. And that was a powerful moment for me realizing that we are all products of our environment. The police come from the public. They themselves, there is a lot of fear. I think a lot of the time it comes from the media. You know, it's, we live in a world of anecdotal versus actual evidence. You know, I, I heard of a, a guy that was, oh, I, I know a few policemen who are read all this thing that the We love to live in a world of anecdotes. And, you know, and, and police feel like they're more in danger now. You, you, you read the reports and police think they're, they're, but statistically, it has never been safer to be a policeman. You know what I mean? But it feels, and that's when you realize how it feels is often more important than what it actually is. And that's where the media plays a big role in accurately portraying what it actually is so that people work within those parameters as opposed to the, the emotion that comes about knowing. One of the things that, uh, So when people hear the phrase, I've learned that, that immediately some people shut off. We saw the same thing with, with people who didn't want to vaccinate their children. As soon as they hear vaccination, some people hear autism immediately. 
And and sometimes it's just about just about changing that. It's like let's let's start a new conversation. Let's let's start fresh. I don't. It's a it's 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 a touchy thing. I don't have a gun law in my constitution. I don't have an amendment that says I have the right to bear arms. I haven't grown up in that. And my country was not founded. Ironically, South Africa was founded on a bloodless revolution. So we, I guess, do not have an attachment with guns in that way. Guns are a big part of South African culture because unfortunately there's a lot of gun violence there, mostly illegal weapons. Uh, but but I, don't, I don't think it's a, an obsession with the guns so much as what the guns represent. That's what I feel it is. It's like people are not going, the gun is, it's like, what does gun mean? It was the same thing with the Confederate flag. People were saying, so when I pull that flag down, do I pull down the memory of my great-grandfather? Do I pull down the memory of my family? Do I pull, which parts of it do I have to discard? Do I have to be ashamed to be white? Do I have to be ashamed to be from the South? Do I, and I realize that often, just in that world, with the words we use and the way we have the conversations, it goes so far off the topic that we're no longer talking about guns anymore. We're no longer talking, we're talking, now we're talking about freedoms, and that's how people perceive it. And, and it, it, is a, it is a lot of nuance, it's not easy because people have that ingrained in them. Well, Trevor, I, I want to say something in, in probably a good way. And I mean this, and I, I, I'm looking at this audience and I think they agree with me. Our country has been blessed a lot over the years with our problems. And I think one of our blessings is, is that you're over here and you're going to play a critical role in this election. And I think that's a very positive thing. We're looking forward to it. And I know we all appreciate the candor and the honesty and the depth that you bring to humor you bring to the conversation, you bring this process. So it's been one of my great ones. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you all.